Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely killer talk with Antonio Squilanta talking about rate of force development and its impact on performance. Uh, Guys, Antonio is going to give us a quick background as to where he is, and we're going to dive right into what RFD is, why it's important, and the limitations on it as well. Uh, He shares with us how he evaluates it, how he breaks it down at different levels of training, and how it impacts what he's doing with his athletes, and even shares with us some things that he sees like correlate when he's improving them in the weight room to what actually happens on the field with speed testing. Guys, this is really an awesome talk. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Doc, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for calling. Yeah, man. So uh, listen, let's give everybody the the brief little rundown as as to who you are, where you're at, and what you're you're up to. Uh, My name is Antonio Squilante. I was born and raised in Italy. As right now, I work in Los Angeles. I'm the director of sport performance and training at Velocity Sports Performance. It's a private uh, strength and conditioning facility. We mostly work with uh, high school and collegiate athletes. And I recently uh, was offered the position as a chair for the NSA Weightlifting SIG, the special interest group. So I mostly deal with uh, weightlifting and weightlifting in long-term athletic development, so for youth athletes. That's awesome. So then how long have you been doing uh, things with the NSA with the SIG? Uh, as a member of the SIG for about four years, awesome. uh, just recently the former chair had to step out, so I was offered the position, and as right now I'm taking care of like organizing events and clinics and seminars and whatnot. That's awesome, man. Now, you do a bunch of work online as well when you're involved in groups and things of that nature, and uh, there's been something that is, I mean, fits right in with the weightlifting idea that, that you've kind of wanted to to jump on here and, and talk about. So let's get right into that. Yeah, recently what we uh, have a very good and very active uh, Facebook page for a group, which I invite everyone to join. Uh, it's a very open uh, conversation that goes on on a weekly basis on weightlifting, but more, more in general on uh, power development for sport. 
And what I noticed is that uh, very often uh, the concept of power development is expressed in terms of rate of force development. And a little bit of confusion arises when it comes to a waterfall of exercise like plyometric training, wheel lifting, velocity-based training, or whatnot, where the main goal is to improve peak power output and improve performance of sport as a consequence. Uh, the overall idea of measuring or assessing or improving rate of force development, I realize can be quite uh, deceptive if it's not applied the right way. Uh, in the end, the idea of the concept of rate of force development uh, comes from basic uh, Newtonian mechanics or physics. It's nothing but the rate of change of force over time. Uh, if we apply the same concept to the idea of speed, uh, which can be linear speed, velocity, or bar velocity, uh, is the rate of change of speed over time. If we combine them, as we know from physics, force and velocity combined together give us power. Uh, therefore, we can yes, we can measure the rate of change in power over time, which is a very indicative value, and it's very important when we program uh, strength training in general for sport. But it's not even a number. Like what we're measuring is the slope of a curve that defines how much force or how much velocity we can def uh, we can produce over time. But having a very uh, steep curve doesn't necessarily mean our athletes are getting any better on the field of play. Hmm. Because what we see is, is a change in their ability to recruit their muscle fibers and produce power, but that doesn't mean that the power they can generate is enough to outperform their opponents or to run faster, to jump higher, or to throw farther. And that's why uh, I notice very often people focus on the ability of uh, using, for lack of better words, the stretch shortening cycle that is common in plyometric like activities like jumping or throwing uh, to move quicker and faster, but they don't really take enough care of developing uh, a very solid foundation of general strength and general explosive strength. So absolute strength or relative strength or explosive strength, which is the only way they can actually get their athletes to perform better. Uh, I think this concept was uh, quite well developed years ago by uh, Dr. Fred Atfield. Uh, I think his, his curve, his strength curve is very famous. It's nothing but a U-shaped curve where you can see the downforce or like the amortization phase, the concentric phase, and this quick uh, reactive change between absorbing force and producing force. Okay, rate of force development is nothing but the angle of that curve and how it changes over time. But how high that curve can actually go depends on how strong an athlete is. Uh, we know that uh, strength is a very complex phenomenon mm -hmm. and for the most part is time dependent. So depending on how much time uh, an athlete has available, he or she can produce more strength and therefore more power. When we're working in uh, the sport field, that time frame is very small. Therefore, it's very important to have a very uh, sudden spike in rate of force development. But the highest we can bring that curve to be, the more chances we have our athletes can perform. And that can have a strength, which doesn't necessarily mean very heavy weights uh, move very slowly, like old school power lifting kind of approach, but still entails a certain amount of heavy traditional resistance training in the form of squatting or deadlifting or pressing in the form of uh, very high impact plyometric training, which is what do people often don't realize about plyometric. Falling from a box and jumping on top of another box is an exercise, but it can be performed as a depth jump if you want to improve strength, or the drop jump if you want to improve the activity or rate of force development. Yes, the ultimate goal is being able to react very fast on the ground because that's what makes our athletes better athletes. But the more power they can generate, so the more they get used to do depth jumps instead of drop jumps or squat jumps or weight lifting, why not, like cleans or snatches, the more resources their body have to produce a higher amount of force. And when that force can be produced faster, those athletes are going to be better athletes in the field of play. That we run faster, push off the ground faster, take off harder, and why not? Right. Well, do you feel like that there may be some sort of, uh, you know, I love that you compared to the depth jumps and the drop jumps because Natalia Vorkoshansky is a very good friend of mine, and uh, and she talks about that quite often. But do you, do you think that there is a point of diminishing returns as well, though, when we're talking about 
strength and, and you know general strength and maximal strength and those things in, in regards to improving RFD. For sure, there's a point of like where the return of investment is not worth it anymore. And I think the whole concept of transfer of training or positive transfer of training uh, ends up leading to the same conclusion. Like I remember, I think it was 1994, 1998, uh, Bergen Beda wrote an article on the NSCA uh, asking how much strength is enough mm-hmm. for an athlete to be able to perform. Uh, of course, an athlete does not necessarily to squat three times his or her body weight, his body weight, maybe two times her body weight for a female athlete uh, to necessarily be able to perform faster and be more explosive. But at the same time, if we want that athlete to be able to generate enough peak power output, uh, two times body weight squat for a male athlete or a 1.5 times body weight squat for a female athlete might be a necessary prerequisites uh, before we even move into power training. Virtual Zanaski, Universal it used to say that we really can't express the concept of strength if we don't relate the concept to speed. Mm-hmm. So there's no strength if we don't take in consideration how fast that athlete is using that strength. So strength training per, def- per se, uh, when we want to maximize absolute strength, is low. It's low in nature. Like the bar moves very slow. Even though the athlete is trying to move the bar as fast as he possibly can, the bar is still going to move slow. And that surely doesn't apply to uh, strength training for sport. However, however, it's still necessary for that athlete to be able to tolerate enough uh, muscle strength, ligament strength, tendon strength to be able to tolerate that load in order for that athlete to use more like plyometric like acti- activities, explosive exercise like weightlifting or not. I like it. I like it. So then now let, let's start breaking down things. You know, I mean, you're a coach, you're a researcher, and you're involved in, in these organizations. So, so where do you feel... Uh, is is where coaches need to do better. Where do you feel, where are you seeing, you know, I mean, and internationally as well, because you spent so much time, you know, working across the pond. Uh, yeah. it, where do we need to be better? What do we need to do, in your opinion, where, where are some, what are some boxes we aren't checking that we need to check better? I think, uh, I think the approach, uh, and it's not just in the United States, uh, Europe is very similar as well, uh, other than Western Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe, Uh, the approach tends to be very extreme. Like if you look at the trend in the strength and conditioning industry and you go back to like the early 80s, 90s, it was all about uh, very heavy strength training. Like football players or track and field athletes were squatting very heavy, were doing power cleans very heavy. They were not considering the speed component of the movements. And then more research was produced, more evidence was collected, and that trend slowly changed over time. And now it seems like we move to the opposite extreme where all we care about is speed and rate of force development. All we care about is how fast our athletes can move and how that can apply to strength training, like velocity-based training, or all these devices that can measure uh, vertical bar velocity or whatnot. Uh, we got to the point where we don't, ne- don't even prescribe training in terms of weight or percentages. We prescribe training in terms of speed, which is great. It's a tool. We need to do uh, I really like the definition that Newton and Kramer used in uh, one of their papers in 1994. It's called uh, train integrity, meaning training with different tools together with the ultimate goal of developing, developing power because power is what makes athletes better athletes. It's no absolute strength or linear velocity unless you are a power lifter or you're a sprinter. Everything else in between is a combination of strength and speed. Mm. Uh, I think what we need to do is just to find, it sounds almost like the uh, Fibonacci sequence of numbers, like find the perfect ratio between how much strength an athlete needs, how much speed an athlete needs, and how we can combine different tools to make sure that what we ultimately develop is their ability to perform better in sport. Good, good. All right. That's where I was hoping you were going. So now how would you evaluate that when we're talking about speed versus strength versus power? Because those are really three things that are trained independently, which at the end of the day really may have no positive transfer to the other two. For sure. Uh, The way I assess it is, well, it's different depending on the athletes. Uh, what I like to do, uh, I took this approach from 
Dr. Natalia Berchezanski as well. Uh, if I'm dealing with like younger, uh, less experienced athletes, let's say high school athletes or uh, freshmen in college, uh, of course I would prefer personally to somehow assess power and speed via traditional weight training. But if those athletes don't have the skill to do a power clean or a snatch or to squat heavy, I usually use a normal uh, vertical jump and I test the vertical jump with and without counter movement. Uh, so that can give me an estimate of what is called starting strength when we apply force very quickly without using elastic energy, which is a squat jump, mm -hmm. rather than a counter movement vertical jump where we use more the stretch shortening cycle and we see how much an athlete is capable of just not being explosive but actually using elastic energy to be more productive. Uh, what I like to see is a gap of, well, ideally the gap should be as small as possible. Uh, the counter movement jump, just because of physics, will always be higher. But I really would like to see the squat jump to be as close as possible. Uh, if that's not the case, if there's a huge jump, then I tend to see how well an athlete can perform in e either one of these tests. If they're overall low or below the 15 percentile for the age, age group, at that point, uh, priority in training should be devoted to pretty much everything. You need to make those athletes stronger. You need to make those athletes faster. You have to include plyometrics or why not. On the other hand, if their vertical jump is very high, which normally happens if they train in sport just because of the adaptation that comes with the practice and competition, but they lack strength, at that point, I usually try to implement at least 40% uh, of general strength training, 40% uh, of power development, which is a combination of Olympic weightlifting, plyometric training, velocity-based training, and then maybe a 20% of sport-specific training which comes in the form of explosive training as well. But there's much less emphasis. What I see as a big difference between training power to make athletes better athletes and training power as a specific approach is pretty much what we put on the CNS. Uh, when we do power development via plyometric or via weightlifting, we really want to maximize the amount of mechanical work an athlete can perform. And therefore, we choose movement that are a little bit more general in nature, like a power clean or like a medicine ball toss or a depth jump. Uh, when we do sport-specific training, we sacrifice a little bit of that power output to emphasize more skill. And that's why I only keep just a 20% of that work because it doesn't really provide enough to get that athlete better. Hmm. For older athletes, when there's more experience in training, my favorite way of assessing is the ratio between the snatch and the clean and jerk. We know the snatch by definition is a very fast movement. So it's more like speed oriented. Uh, the clean and jerk is more like a strength movement. It's a little bit slower, but you can move more weight. Ideally, I'm looking for a ratio between the two of approximately 78 to 82 uh, percent. If that ratio is somehow uh, skewed on one direction or the other, the athlete need more speed work. If their snatch is heavier, but their clean is lighter than the average, or more strength work. Uh, sorry, more strength work if their snatch is higher than the average. More speed work if their clean is higher than the average. So I kind of use what I see to develop the training program. So when you're looking at those things with the bar velocity and the and the one RMs, I'm assuming, right? You're looking at like one rep maxes and the clean and jerk and the snatch. Yes, right. When you're looking at those and those those um, ratios, what what do you see when you time them? Like if they're actually running sprints, like where do we see that uh, correlator connect in when it comes to like absolute speed numbers, because as, as awesome and as cool and as fun as weightlifting stuff is, at the end of the day, like the big thing that shows up is if they are fast around the field. I agree. And I think that's where uh, more technology and rate of force development really comes into play. Uh, what I notice is that, see, let's take for example, for, for instance, like a snatch, a normal snatch. Uh, if snatching for a win, we want to uh, ultimately improve the amount of weight he or she can move when he snatches or she snatches because that's the nature of the competition. When we're training with athletes and we want that speed to carry over to performance sport, I don't really care. Once I find a good weight that allows that athlete to move with enough speed, and at that point I would have to measure the speed of the bar, I don't really care about that weight going up. I rather care about that bar moving faster with the same amount of weight on the bar. If that happens, I do see a one-on-one -on -one correlation with speed and linear velocity. 
because at that point I know that an athlete can overcome inertia with more speed. And that inertia can come in the form of a weighted bar or it can come in the form of his own body weight when he sprints. That athlete will be able to have a much higher rate of force development, move faster and sprint faster. I noticed that when I try to emphasize more the weight itself, let's say keeping the same speed but being able to move more weight at the same speed, that correlation kind of dies a little bit. Hmm. I like it. I like Again, it. Again, it's my approach. It doesn't have, it's not entirely evidence-based. No, no, but I like it. I mean, it's, it's what you're doing, and you're telling me what you're seeing, and you're telling us how you're implementing it. I mean, you really can't ask for much more than that, Doc. So where can people find out more about you? Where can they stay up to date with what you're doing, what you're researching, and, and what you're doing with these athletes out there on the left coast? Well, they can, uh, uh, first and foremost, I will invite them to follow our Facebook page for the NSA with Lifting SIG or Special Interest Group. Uh, it's a private page, so they will have to ask for like joining it. But everyone is welcome, regardless of the of them being more or less involved with the NSA. Uh, there are a lot of amazing people uh, sharing research on that on that Facebook page, and there's a lot of conversation going on every week. And it's very evidence based and also practice based. So there are a bunch of coaches, high school coaches, college coaches, on the website. Uh, a lot on elitetrack.com, where a bunch of other uh, very good coaches uh, write about track and field, but not just track and field. It's much more uh, diverse than that. And overall, we just invite them to follow whatever the NSCA has available because the overall weightlifting community within the NSCA is growing. And with the weightlifting community, the, the overall experience in terms of develop, developing more powerful and stronger athletes uh, is bridging the gap between theory and practice. And that's what we ultimately want. So just follow us on the any publication that the NSCA uh, publication the NSCA has, from the Journal of Strength and Conditioning to uh, Strength Coach, which is a much more uh, practice oriented uh, publication. Uh, there's plenty of good materials available. Awesome, awesome, and of course Instagram and all that as well, right? Absolutely, Instagram, Facebook, social media, yes. What's your uh, What's your IG and your your uh, Twitter handle for everybody will watch right now? Uh, Twitter is just Antonio Squilante, uh, Squilante, S-Q-U-I-L-L-A-N-T-E. Uh, awesome. uh, on uh, Instagram is Antonio, under slash, my last name, C-S-C-S, and on Facebook is just Antonio Squilante. So they can, they're more than welcome to contact me, private message me if they have any questions. I like to share what I have and what I know with everyone. Awesome, man. Well, listen, Doc, appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. This is fantastic, and uh, people are going to love this. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, man. Well, cheers. We'll be in touch real soon. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. And a huge thanks to Antonio Scolante for spending the time and being with us today. Guys, just awesome stuff. The man breaking down what he's seeing, how it's impacting training, and how it's impacting performance. Can't thank him enough for all he's doing for us to help make the profession better through the SIG through all the content he's putting out, and through all the research. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Antonio, and thank you for joining us today. As always, guys, if you enjoyed the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we possibly can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.